Yep. Okay, thank you everybody for coming. I'm John Nelson. I'm a master gardener with Cornell Cooperative Extension. I'm here to tell you how about attracting pollinators to your garden today. If my head ends up being in the way where you can't see the screen, yeah, I'm kind of waiting and I'll move from one, from one side to the other to get out of your way. So uh, we'll start with just a little bit on, you know, why do we care about pollinators? And then I would, uh, this section on, and when I say the word pollinators, what do I mean? Who are we trying to attract to our gardens? Then we'll get to the part you really want. Uh, how do you attract them to your garden? So this is how you know, you know we, we read a lot of news stories, of course, all the all the bad things happening with pollinators right now, whether it's pollinator collapse disorder or all the native bee numbers that are down. You know, one of them bumblebees is now on the species list. The monarch butterfly numbers are down like over 90% what they used to be. So we don't see nearly as many monarchs in our gardens as we used to. So we could do a whole talk on what the reason for all these is all the different multiple causes. But we'll skip those details today and just talk about you know, why are pollinators so important. So um, 87 and 115 major food crops depend on pollinators. So in terms of, for, from our kind of selfish viewpoint for us wanting to eat, uh, an awful lot of food crops depend on it. Uh, another number is one out of every three mouthfuls of food that we eat depends on pollinators. Uh, you're probably all good at math and you're saying 87 is a lot more than one third of 115. And I'll explain that discrepancy in a minute. Uh, and then there's, you know, they're very important for native ecosystems. They're what is called the keystone species. And that they're very important for the plants and things that they pollinate, but they're also very important for things to eat them. So they're, they're kind of in the middle where they're important for organisms that organisms that eat them for the food chain, but they're very important for the pollination and stuff that they do as well. So just talking about the food crops, once we're going to take the turn here. So and you look at the food crops that depend on pollinators, uh, pretty much any fruit that you eat depends on a pollinator. Um, almost all the nuts except for peanuts depend on pollinators. Many, many vegetables depend on pollinators, and there's even more that have a higher yield when pollinators are around. And then lots of other things. Uh, chocolate, if you're a chocoholic like me, uh, depends on pollinators, or coffee and tea, depends on all of our spices, vanilla. If you want to come in and there's an extra chair, you guys, see what you weigh in. Uh, most of the spices. So, you know, there's a, you would, I think we would miss a lot of these things if they were gone. So, why was it only a, one of every three mouthfuls? It's what's missing here is the grains. You know, wheat, corn, barley, oats, all the major grains, those are wind pollen. Uh, so, that's why, you know, they're, they're a huge part of our diet, but the animals that feed on them are a huge part of our diet. So, that's why it's a large number of crops, but it's only one out of every three mouthfuls because of all the wind pollinated rain. In terms of a keystone species, as I said, the flowering plants depend on pollinators. The butterfly and moth larvae, the caterpillars, are a key bird food. Uh, the number for you here, uh, for a single pair of chickadees to raise their young, you need something between 6,000 and 9,000 characters. Wow. So uh, you know, the pollinators and the larvae are really important for the, all the birds and things we're trying to track. And then they're important for pest and insect control. As you see a little later, they're heavily involved in controlling pest insects as well. So they do more than pollinate. Some of them are also controlling pests. So they're really a critical part of our environment. I'll just comment here, you have a lot of people in this one want to pollinators to the garden and say, I'd like more birds in my garden. If you do a good job on the pollinators, you'll get the birds. And if you've got lots of butterfly and moth caterpillars around, and the birds will come in because that is something going to feed their young. So you really if you want to attract birds to your gardens, start here with getting lots of pollinators. Okay, let's answer that question. You know, who are who are these pollinators? If I ask the people to guess one, the first one ever automatically suggests to be the bees. And everybody has been thinking about the European honeybee, which mm -hmm. is a name implies it's not a native bee. It was brought over by the early colonists. So it's a fantastic honey producer. It really is the key that's best at producing honey. Uh, it is not the one of our native bees. Uh, it does, it's not causing any problems, but uh, it's not a native. We have the over 400 bee species native to New York. Uh, most of them are solitary. Uh, a lot of them are nesting in the ground, and they have various, uh, kind of divided into various types, like cellophane bees and longhorn bees and mine bees. That just reflects uh, their bees. The cellophane bees don't really use cellophane, but they have a cellophane like material that is aligned in nests. Uh, there's the mason bees, the ones that nest in those tubes. 
I mean, they have mason bee houses, the little bit of so it. Actually, they could do a nest of hollow plant stems. Uh, the leaf cutter bees are the ones that cut little pieces of your rose leaves or other things to make their nests. Uh, and then carpenter bees are the ones that are not get drilling holes in your siding and drilling holes in your deck and everything. Uh, but they're all solitary bees. Then we'll deal with some social bees. We have, of course, the bumblebees and some of the sweat bees. And then we have parasitic bees. All it means is they actually uh, are too lazy to make their own nest. They follow one of these solitary bees back to her nest. And when she leaves, they go in and toss out her egg and add their own. Or they put in their egg and it hatches first and goes after her eggs. But anyway, so uh, they get their egg up the parasitic because they're going in there and stealing the, stealing the, the host bees nest or egg and then putting their own in there. So we have this wide range of bees. Um, in terms of flowers, uh, many are generalists. So we're going to any flower. Uh, some are specialized, but basically as long as you're providing flowers from spring until fall, uh, the bees will be happy. Uh, you'll see the spring to fall message on my slides repeatedly, because it's really something when you're trying to have a pollinator garden, you want flowers from as early in spring as possible until as late in fall as possible. So just let's take bumblebees, for example. The bumblebee queens right now are someplace in your garden underneath the leaf litter or down in a mouse hole or something. And they're overwintering. When they come out in the spring fairly early, they're going to be able to eat. They have you know, hybrid, hybrid or pollen. Just so they're looking for early flowers. And that bumblebee queen will get her nest going. She'll get the initial brood of workers going. And then she'll raise her young all summer. And then toward the end of the summer, the new queen will get tossed out of the nest for her waiting, waiting flight. And then they need to fatten up before they hibernate over the winter. So in the late summer, early fall, the new bumblebee queens are definitely looking for food. That's where if you rely on a healthy bumblebee <coughs> population, they need food early, all through the summer, and as late as possible. And we'll talk about different flowers to do that later. Before I run up expense, and people say, okay, how important are these bee species? From Cornell scientists did a study on apple orchards, both here in the Finger Lakes and down in the Hudson Valley. And over 100 of our major bee species were allowed in pollinating those apples. So it's not just honeybees that pollinate the apples, but our native bees are heavily involved. So perhaps one that isn't your favorite uh, are the wasps. Uh, wasps actually are one of my favorite pollinators. There's actually hundreds of native species in New York. There's probably many more wasps than there are bees. There's typically worldwide about five times as many wasp species as there are bee species. Most are solitary, uh, either nesting in the ground like bees, uh, or nesting in stems, or ones that make little mud nests. The, the social ones are the ones that tend to give all the rest of them a bad rep because they're the ones that, you know, their, their sting is to get close to their nests like the paper wasp or the yellow jackets or the hornets. And then just like the bees, there's parasitic wasps that follow the solitary wasp around and go in and, 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 and toss their egg under the nest, put their own in. So they have exactly the same issue. Wasps and bees are very closely related, so it's pretty much the same behavior. The big benefit of wasps, though, is change size here, is that they provide us a double benefit. The adult wasps are pollinators. All they can eat is nectar. You think about that narrow wasp waste, they really can't. They can't eat solid food. Uh, but their larvae are carnivorous. The larvae eat insects. And this is where we get a lot of great pest control. The reason the wasp is a really scary stinger isn't for us, it's because he's a hunter. He's constantly out hunting caterpillars, spiders, aphids, other pests to feed to her young in dark. So they're very often pest species. She stings them. You know, it's a cruel world. She stings them, but doesn't kill them. They're paralyzed. Brings them back to their nest so that her young can eat the live, live, unspoiled prey. You know, she, doesn't, she, doesn't want them, she doesn't want them eating rotten meat, so wants them eating healthy stuff. Um, so the, the wasp, and by the way, the, the, I, I just finished reading a book on wasps and Sam, basically the wasps that are really ancestors for both the bees and the ants. And this author's time about the bee is just a wasp that's gone vegetarian and forgotten how to hunt. Uh, so, um, again, for flowers. Many are generalists, some are quite specialized. You want to provide blooms again all summer long. I'll tell you wasp is something uh, when you have wasps in your garden, as long as you don't go near one of the social wasp nests, as long as you steep, steer clear of the, of the nest of the yellow jacket or the horn, or whatever, they're really fair, no, no more difficult than bees. Um, one author of Butcher Red said, when they're out foraging on flowers, you can even touch them. I'm not saying don't do that, but she's actually, as long as you, they're not defending their nest, they're generally pretty passive. 
So again, provide blue all summer long, uh, and wasp are a great addition to your garden. Of course, probably everybody's favorite pollinator is the butterflies, because they're so pretty. Uh, we have over 50 species of butterfly in New York State that are native. The monarch, of course, uh, uh, that it was kind of one of people the first. But the fritillaries, the animals, the crescents, etc. We have lots of different butterflies. The key thing on butterflies, just put the slide here. Um, so flower preferences. Think about that wingspan. They need some place to land. So they need a flat or a spiky flower. So unlike the bees and wasps that can crawl into things and move around on things, we kind of track butterflies when they go flat or spiky, something so they can land that big wing, wingspan. And they love bright colors. So you go for bright flowers that are flat or spiky, and you've got a butterfly garden. But there's a second piece. Every butterfly begins life as a caterpillar. So they need their host plant. Uh, if you want to think, if you don't have the host plant, you're missing a key half the equation. So you know, let's, take, let's take monarchs, for example. If you don't have any milkweed, that, that caterpillar had to grow up in somebody else's yard. And the adult butterfly can come over time to your yard. But when she wants to lay her eggs, she has to leave and go back and find her host plant. So if you don't have the host plant, you're really missing a key half of the equation. So you want to make sure you have the host plants. You want lots of butterflies. Yes, the flat, spiky, colorful flowers are great. But you need the host plants too. Otherwise, there's no place for the caterpillars to grow up, and there's no place for the female butterfly to lay her eggs. The other half of the Lepidoptera is the moths. We actually have more moth species in New York uh, than butterflies. We have a over 300 native moth species. Uh, they can be extremely striking. This is a, a luna moth. It's about a four-inch wingspan. The Cecropia moth is about a six-inch wingspan. We just don't see these things because most of them are active at night. There's a few active in the daytime, but most are active at night, so we don't see them. But we have tons and tons of really interesting moths flying around our gardens when they're not out there. So flower preference, most moths because they're active at night. They want to, they're looking for a strong evening scent. They're navigating more by scent than by color. So color really is less important. If you have a flower that opens at night, like a four o'clock or evening primrose, or smells more strong at night, if you've ever grown flowering tobacco, the Christiana, you walk out in the evening, it smells a lot more than it smells during the daytime because it's moth pollen in the flower. Basically, it pumps up the fragrance at night to deliberately attract the moths. Just like the butterflies, uh, every moth begins life as a caterpillar, so you really want to have lots of host plants out for the moths. Um, they're really, because there's way more moths than butterflies, uh, the birds are really hunting moth caterpillars more than they're hunting butterfly caterpillars. Uh, and they're really critical as a, as a, bird, as a bird feed, baby, so baby birds. And a lot of those probably bird feeders are not full of seeds. Seeds are a wonderful winter and fall food for birds. So the adult birds eat the winter and fall. But it allows you food to baby, baby birds. Too dry, too tough. Baby birds need something soft and gooey and moist and full of fats and proteins like that kind of thing. Uh, so, the first year we planted flowers and plants and stuff, one evening I was out watering plants, and for the first time, I'm sure everybody else has seen it before, but I've seen a hummingbird mom. I mm -hmm. thought it was really cool. Yeah, that, that, that's a cool one. But anyway, what effect? <laughs> I yeah. can't remember what plan I think. I, I, I know how many moths are on our hunting flowers. I just, I just not, I can't remember exactly what their specialty is. Uh, and then, and sometimes they have a list of host plants. They have their picture host plants. I just thought, I don't remember. But I didn't you know. see any this year. I've seen, yeah. I've seen a couple last year. They're there on these walkers. They look like yeah. they, they're, they're really cool. like the range of like the hunting birds. Hunting birds. No, they're mostly hunters. Yeah, they're, 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 they're never seen on them. Right. Back during the day. Yeah, a lot of moths are out. Mm -hmm. hours, but, um, so anyway, they're great for picking neighbors. Just counting numbers wise, 95% of caterpillars end up being birds. So really, oh. so they had moths, they, they lay tons of eggs, there's tons of caterpillars, and most of them don't ever make good altars. So that's where you really you want these host plants out there. And I said right, if you want to track birds, get these host plants out there, because yeah, most of those butterflies, the caterpillars end up being bird food. And even birds like robins, we also have like robins hunting for worms. Yes, robins do hunt for worms, but they rather hunt for caterpillars. It's a lot easier and faster. You know, I prick at the top of the tree and get a caterpillar and go around trying to find that worm in the lawn. So, uh, moths are a great one uh, for pollinators and for getting helping the birds. 
one you may not have thought of are flies. Actually, flies are the second most important pollinator. Fly pollination is an extremely important pollination. Um, I took this picture. We were talking to some friends who said, little bouquet of flowers from the garden. And when this thing first landed, we're all like, oh, a bee's on a flower. And then we looked a little closer. And the bee are hard to see right here. The wings are wrong. The wings are fly wings. The eyes are wrong. The eyes are fly eyes. This is a, a common flower fly. Uh, so it, it may look like a bee, but it couldn't sting you at the time. Uh, that's just false coloration. Uh, but so there are lots of flies out there doing pollination. Uh, and actually, the chocolate is pollinated by a small mid. So, in, for, so chocolate is, is uh, fly pollinated. But there's certainly probably second in importance to bees. And again, fly, now fly larva, when they talk about wasp and bees, the mother wasp or the mother bee takes care of the young. Fly larva can feed themselves. The mother just lays the eggs and never sees them again. Some are down in the leaf litter, but they help decompose the leaf litter. Some are crawling around on plants hunting. So the fly larva basically takes care of feeding itself. But again, it can be important. The ones that are crawling around hunting can be important for pest control. So the flies uh, are a very important pollinator. Um, they, a lot of them are generalists. So a lot of flies are just a lot of different flowers. And actually, there's a lot of research right now trying to figure out how important flies are, the importance of flies and pollination kind of a recent finding. But they tend to like flat or bowl-shaped flowers, things like bows, like Queen Anne's lace. Some of them like a musty odor. So things like skunk cabbage and errands, all the jack and the pulpit, et cetera, are definitely all pollinated by flies. But this, the, the flies in your garden are doing uh, a lot of pollination, a lot of good things for you. So when you see the flies out there, realize they're doing good work. You should leave the burger the long run. Yes. <laughs> well, that's a different fly. That's a different fly. That's not the house. The house. The house. We're not. I'm not talking about house flies. Um, beetles are also involved in pollination. I can't give you. There's over thirty thousand beetle species in the U.S. I couldn't get a number from New York State. I couldn't get a number for how many are found in pollination. But things like the soldier beetles and longhorn beetles and snout beetles are all involved in pollination. Uh, it's less common than all that we talked about so far. Uh, but actually, they were the very first pollinators. Flowers first started evolving, the bees and the wasps and stuff weren't around. Uh, so the beetles were the very first pollinator. We do know that they are involved in pollinating. Uh, bowl shaped you know, bowl shaped flowers that are white, dull green, have a fruity aroma. And some of our older plants, like magnolias and water lilies and pawpaw, are all pollinated by beetles. If you think about a magnolia flower, those pot, those petals are really thick and leathery and heavy. That's because they have to support the weight of the beetle when it comes from the pollinator. So the bees can the bees are very light and just come in and make so they can pollinate very dangerous things. Beetles, you know, when they hit those are big heavy critters falling around. So that's why the, the things that are pollinated by beetles tend to have those thicker, heavier, stouter petals. Um, they're not a glamorous pollinator, they're called mess and soil pollinators. Mess because they're eating the flower as they pollinate, and soil because if you gotta eat, you gotta go. They're defecating in the flower water colony. So it's not the most glamorous, sexy pollinator, uh, but they do get the job done. Okay, that's all That's all the insects, finally. Uh, but we do have one bird involved in pollination in New York State. That's our ruby throated hummingbird. Uh, so they love tubular flowers for that long, for that long bill. They need lots of nectar because they're a high energy species. And they, they like an orange bed color, though that's not super important. Oh, it doesn't matter, they can't smell. Uh, so it doesn't matter it doesn't have flower smells or not. Um, I listed here a set of species that are all native plants that come in with beetles. So there's lots of non-native as well, of course. But these are all natives that the 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 so is that you're sending them the plant list or the slides at some point or uh, yes, I believe after we we haven't printed them out, but I believe after okay. we'll, we'll send them. So I I, I said. Uh, I provided the temperature with both the top of these slides and the native plant list. So I guess at some point after the presentation, you'll get those. So I, I can now somebody trying to jot things down and work pretty fast yourself. You'll get that. What about, so, what about dragonflies? They have a lot of dragonflies. They're, they're hunting other insects. Dragonflies are hunters. Okay. So, but, but that's a great sign. If you're getting dragonflies in your garden, it means you've got enough flies, wasps, bees, etc. That it's worth for them coming in the hunt. Oh, okay. So that's uh, they're there. So they're they're hunting other insects, but the fact you have them there means you've got enough insects that it's worth worth their while to be there. Oh, that's cool. actually a good sign. 
<clears throat> How about that? Not here. If I, if I was out in California or in Mexico or the desert southwest giving this talk, we'd have to talk about the bats that are important for pollen and cactus and other plants up there. But here in New York, our bats are either going after fruit or going after insects. They're not involved in pollen. So that, I think, is all the pollinator slides. So yeah, we'll talk about so I just have, I'll just pause here to say, you know, so you realize that out in your garden, there's a lot more going on than the food. You've got all these different insects. One of the fun things when you're out in your garden, if you're out weeding or doing things, just kind of slow down and stare at what insects are visiting your flowers. And you'll be really impressed with all the different sizes and colors and shapes and things. There's really an amazing array of pollinators in that garden. So sort of sometimes just, just slowing down and just saying, okay, what all are on these flowers? And you'll see the little tiny bees that are smaller than that. Of an inch, and this is different flies, this is bigger bee, different wasp. There's really a lot of neat stuff in our yard. Okay, so attract these pollinators. Um, they really care about the same things we care about. They want a safe environment, they want shelter, they want water, and they want food. And so we're going to walk through those in order. I'll just before I did it, I'll comment that the Master Gardener program here in Monroe um, County has a pollinator friendly garden program. So if you want to get your garden certified as being pollinator friendly, Look for the information on our website. There'll be a link at the end of the slides that we get sent out later. And you can buy one of these nifty slides to put in your garden if you get certified. And I will talk about the requirements for that uh, as I go through the rest of the talk. So let's start with a safe environment. <clears throat> so, um, so we're going to make the environment safe for pollinators. The first thing we're going to work on is removing invasive plants. Uh, the invasive plants displace our native plants. They're often not as beneficial for pollinators. Uh, they disrupt the ecosystems. We really would like to get rid of those uh, in, our, in our gardens. Um, there's a whole, whole separate talk on what the invasive plants are and how to deal with them. But things like garlic, mustard, and swallow lord, all the various invasive plants, we'd like to not have in our gardens. Uh, and then we want to either eliminate uh, or minimize pesticide use. <clears throat> so you recognize that we're going to have uh, pollinators in our gardens. Uh, there's going to be some insect damage, and we should be happy about that. I mean, if, if I have monarch butterfly caterpillars crawling at my milk, the milkweed leaves are going to start looking pretty bad. But I'll be, you know, I haven't had that happen recently. I'll be really, really happy if I had some monarch caterpillars crawling around. Or the leaf cutter bees are going to cut holes in the leaves, and all those other caterpillars are going to do a little chewing before the birds find them and eat them. Uh, so basically, you know, so having some damage uh, is actually a good thing. We don't want to have a perfect garden. Uh, Doug Palame is kind of the expert on, uh, on this new approach to gardening. Is kind of what he's got what he calls his 10 step program for dealing with damage to your native plants. You take 10 steps away and you can't see it. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so we just learn, you know, we just want to learn to live with it. Uh, this is going on to the next slide. Let's talk about pesticides a bit. So uh, notice I didn't say no pesticides, I said eliminate reduce because there are times that we get. Kind of forced into using pesticides. So, if you're trying to keep that last ash tree alive in your yard, you're going to have to treat it for hemlock ash borer or even lose it. Or if you got a hemlock, you're trying to protect from hemlock woolly belt. If you got some viburnum, you're trying to protect from viburnum leaf beetle. Or something you're trying to protect from Japanese beetle. Those are not, those are all invasive insects. Those are all bugs that came here in an invasive way. So, nobody's hunting them. None of our native species are hunting them. And if you're trying to save a plant, you may have to use pesticides. But, we can certainly minimize their use. So we have some guidelines that we ask you to follow for our, our, our pollinator friendly garden program. And number one is that we, we clearly identify the pest before we take any action. So you know, we figure out what exact insect uh, is on this plant. And then we don't apply pesticides unless we really have to keep the plant alive. Uh, just to give an example, I have some plants in my garden, uh, a tall flower called tough plant was getting attacked by aphids two, three years ago. Uh, I knew the plant was pretty tough, so I said, I'm, I'm just going to wait around and see what happens. Now, within a few days, the wasps found the aphids, and I had wasps all over the plant on the aphids. And pretty soon, the aphids are down to a very manageable level. And they come, they actually tend to come back every year, but the wasps are on them in a heartbeat. But I think the wasps are now like nesting in the, in the, in the area. So I don't have to do anything. I mean, the, yeah, the bugs are there, it's damaged, but they're turning in, the bugs are turning in the wasp food. Uh, so that, in that case, I didn't have to treat. Uh, so, but it sometimes you may have to. Uh, if we do, we're just going to follow the label. We're going to make sure we follow the label instructions on the product for three reasons. One, we don't want to poison ourselves. That's a good uh, 
Two, we don't want to damage the environment. A lot of pesticides, for example, you can't use around water because they're bad for fish. And then third, we want it to work the first time. You know, we don't want to mix it up wrong, chew the loot or whatever, and apply it and have it fail. And then we can go back and do it again. So if we wanted to be, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right for fun directions. And then we're going to try and go as low impact as possible. Right? We're going to try and cultural oil, insecticide, so something low impact. Uh, if the plants are bloom, they won't spread. Uh, so if you, if you, if you, if you can, if they, some people say if you, if you really see something that's blooming, cut all the flowers off first. Basically, make it unattractive pollinators. And then, you know, apply it, you know, direct many times, avoid the spray drift, all of those things, so that we minimize. So we basically only treat the plant we have to treat and it goes no place else. And the final couple of guidelines, um, we don't want to fog or spray for mosquitoes or flies. You know, the various services that come out announcing you know, mosquito control, they're going to fog your yard. Um, even if they say they're, they're just, that what they're using is safe for bees, you saw earlier in my talk, there's wasps, there's butterflies, there's flies, there's beetles. Have they really tested a mixture it's safe for that whole huge list? I doubt it. Uh, so we really want to avoid fogging. And then for lawn grub control, again, laws tend to be a pollinated desert, but to really make sure it's a pollinated desert, report to leave the grubs moderately low, so any clover flowers, et cetera, are gone. And that way, when you treat your law, and pollinators aren't going to be there. So those are our guidelines for pesticide control. Probably more than you wanted to hear about that topic. Um, so let's talk about shelter. So pollinators need protection from predators. You know, there's a lot of things hunting them, like the dragonflies in, in your yard hunting them. And they need protection from <clears throat> severe weather. Uh, they also need nesting sites, particularly overwintering habitat. So if you think about a pollinator moving through your garden, you want to incorporate various canopy layers from the trees at the top to the bushes to the lower perennials. Um, you got to see over here on this side too. So. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> so basically, we want we want you think about a pollinator coming into your yard. You want a, a pathway where it has trees, shrubs, bushes. Plants in a big clear lawn area are going to be very hard to reach safely. Right. They get to fly in the open, risk getting hunted that cross that whole distance. So you want half of the move through yards in kind of a connected way. Uh, we want a lot of very material ground level for overwintering and nesting. Uh, pollinators, a lot at this time of year, they're all in the leaf litter or the base of plants or stems. They're in various places. So they want a lot of very material left at ground level. And that'll give them lots of shelter. There's another slide on this. We basically want to be, uh, be a little messy. You know, we're going to we want to leave bare ground uh, for all those brown nesting bees and wasps. So we want to have in place of our garden have bare little or no mulch. Definitely no landscape fabric. That's a barrier that can't they absolutely can't get to. So don't avoid landscape fabric. We're leaving dead. You know, we want to leave stuff around: dead snags, rotten logs, piles of branches, leaf litter, etc. For the nest. Uh, we want you know, rock piles and walls are great for the nest. And, we want to minimize fall cleanup. I'll talk about that more in the next slide. But I think about pollinator friendly gardens is actually they can do less work than regular gardens. If you're doing less cleanup in the fall, that's less work for all of us. That's fun. Uh, you can get designs for bee boxes and other insect houses on the internet. You can buy some commercially. Um, I like this site. I found this on the internet. Somebody went down in our workshop and basically cleaned up some old logs and old bits of bamboo tubing and some old firewood. They drilled holes with it in their power drill and then just put it out in the yard to pollinate habitat. You know, it didn't cost them any money at all, right? They just went and cleaned up the basement a bit and turned it into a bunch of nice pollinator habitat throughout in the yard. So you really don't you don't have to spend a lot of money to do this. You can you can work with materials you have lying around in the house or in the corner of the garden or whatever and, and use that to create pollinator habitat. So fall cleanup, this is doing less is gives us a lot more for the pollinators. Um, so we really want to uh, basically and leave as many fall and leaves as possible. So in the fall, when I'm driving around my neighborhood and I see these big leaf piles on the curb, the people have blown all leaves on the curb. So I think what a way. Anyway, first of all, from a nutrition standpoint, think of all the nutrients that those leaves that put them left on the garden. But then, then so the same person probably just put fertilizer on their tree for next year. But then there's a the thing you can't see: is all the insects that we're going to overwinter in that leaf litter. All the Bees and wasps and other things, even, even some caterpillars. Some of our butterflies, the caterpillar drops from the tree and spins its cocoon in the leaf litter for the winter to come up in that spring. So you, that's the part you don't see. 
They've blown all that stuff at the curve too. So all the various beneficial insects are sitting on the curve and they picked up with the bees. So you want to leave as much as possible because they said the the cane leaves rate nutrients. There's a lot of bees and things in shallow burrows just underneath the ground. They can use the insulation on the top. The good thing about this year, we've had no, almost no snow. From the cold temperatures, the leaves really provide vital insulation. We want to leave the dead perennials because there's a lot of insects that are overwintering at the stems or near the base. You know, those, those mason bees often nest in hollow stems rather than those bamboo trees that we put out. The seed heads are great for overwintering birds. Now, sometimes tall perennials will flop over the winter and kind of get unsightly. So the suggestion there is just cut them back about 18 inches because most of the insects are coming, course, coming in at ground level, they're nesting in the bottom of the plant at the top. And basically, you can just cut them off at 18 inches, and there's a technique called chop and drop. Which basically, you cut it off at 18 inches, and then the top, you just cut it to like one foot length, and just drop it where you're cutting. And it'll go on top, but those tall perennials will go right through it next year anyway. So again, no work, no hauling for the curve. We just stand up until I'm cutting up 18 inches, chopping up and dropping. Uh, so I took a picture of my garden. It's not the greatest picture, but so there's a bunch of cut stems cut up here and a bunch of flower heads. So basically, you can leave it all winter. Fall cleanup's a lot less work. And by the time spring comes along, if it hasn't fallen all over, you can just go over and look at the back of your hand or a rake, just knock it all over. So it really, uh, a pollinator friendly garden is a whole lot less work. You're looking at it can be nice to make sure it has much work for yourself. It's a great way to go. There are a few exceptions. Uh, for vegetable gardens, we do want to do a thorough cleanup every year because there's a lot of non native pests that can get established in the vegetable garden. You want to clear things out so the tomato cutworms and various things are gone. Uh, and then there's some non native perennials that peonies is always recommended to clean up every year. But things like pastas that when they're frost, they're kind of a slimy, sloppy mess. You know, some of those you like just like to clean up for aesthetics, but typically that's only for non native perennials. Natives, actually, out of the fields of natives, nobody cleans them up. You can do the same thing in your garden, and you can do a lot less work. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about water. Uh, pollinators do need water. <clears throat> you know, the mason bees need mud, and when the, the mud bobbing wasps need mud, the water sources need to be shallow or very sloping side. Because they obviously it's too, it's very easy for these little bugs to drown if they ran on some deep water. So there's some simple examples like a bird bath. If you have a bird bath with a dripper, so the bird bath overflows and you drown next year. That's perfect. Because in the wild, the animals work out of mud puddles and so simple things. So that'll work fine. You can bird bath with some gravel and other materials so it's shallow in one area, they can land on the gravel. A bird bath even with some floating wood chips, they can land on the floating chips. I found this example on the internet, one of my favorites. A woman kind of had an old bowl in her kitchen she wasn't using and some marbles the kids weren't playing with anymore. So she filled the bowl with marbles and added water. And the bees, you can see it's covered in bees. They can land on the top and then as they drink, as they drink the water, they can crawl between the marbles to get more. And she was doing so well with this, she had to fill it twice a bit. So she got a bigger bowl and more marbles. Uh, and then she fill it once a bit. So we know that again, these things don't cost a lot of money. It's cheap, easy to lose. Now I know when them say, you know, leave water off the things, people start saying, well, what about mosquitoes? Well, it turns out you know, there's, a of, there's a lot of different mosquito species around, but up here, the mosquitoes take at least four to five days to go from an egg to an adult mosquito. So as long as you dump the water twice a week, you can never generate mosquitoes. It takes them at least five days. So if you decide, okay, every Sunday and Wednesday, I'm going to dump the water, it will never create any mosquitoes because you'll dump the water out. So just a little cleanup, and you can do this type of thing safely and not have any mosquitoes. And by the way, I just put it So I mentioned our pollinator friendly garden program. Uh, this is some requirements for a safe environment. As long as you don't acquire any new invasive plants and consider removing ones, you have is fine. Pesticides, as long as you follow those detailed guidance, guidelines are happy. Shelter, I mentioned various different ways to provide shelter. As long as you do like three of them, you're great. And if you have one water source, we're happy. So really, it's, it's pretty simple to make a pollinator from the garden. <clears throat> okay, the part you're talking about is when am I going to talk about plants? So let's start into that. <clears throat> so we talk about providing food for pollinators. We want to plant in groups for pod for, for efficiency. So you know, not just one of something, unless it's a big tree. But you know, we're talking about perennials, you know, once is a three or five, 
So when it blooms, there's a lot of flowers, a lot of nectar, a lot of things going to go after. <clears throat> we want to emphasize the native plants because those are the plants that our pollinators are all familiar with. We want a big diversity because, you know, like you saw, you know, butterflies like flat flowers and bees like this flowers and beetles like that. You know, so we want a wide range of flowers. We want things blooming from spring until fall. I talked about how important it was for bumblebees and screw for wasps and various things and screw for butterflies. You know, when the modern butterflies come out and get ready to migrate south in the fall, they need to eat their way to Mexico. So the butterfly doesn't let they, 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 they need food all the way. So again, we want all those flowers there as long as you count in the ground. We want to avoid doubles and other hybrid flowers. I'll talk about that more in a minute, but they tend to have less pollen and nectar or they have shapes that pollinators can't use. More perennials than annuals, because perennials have more nectar and pollen. And again, we want to be messy. If you can leave fallen fruits as food for the bees and beetles, etc., they'll really increase the, the honey, the, the sugar, and, and things in those. So, <clears throat> you want to have a from the garden. These are the requirements we set out. You want to have some native trees and shrubs, but four different ones, uh, one of each. And I'll, talk, and I'll talk about some examples in a minute. And we ask you to have at least 27 native perennials, nine different species, so three of each. We want three to bloom early, three to bloom middle, and three to bloom late. And I'll give you examples of those in a minute. Uh, and then for host plants, we'd like three of these 31 different plants to be a host plant. So at least three of the plants are a host for some butterfly or some moth. Um, so it's a pretty simple requirement. It doesn't take a lot of space to do this. Uh, let's kind of walk through what we mean here. But I'm going to pause before I do that and say, Okay, I, I keep saying native plants, native plants, native plants. What does it mean to be a native plant? The, the dictionary or the USDA definition is a plant that's part of the balance of nature that's been that's developed over hundreds of thousands of years in a particular region or ecosystem. Only plants found in this country before European settlement can be considered native. So there's this phrase in a particular region or ecosystem. What is that going to mean? So uh, if I want to be really strict, I can say plants that are native and sourced within a 50 mile radius of Monroe County. And I probably won't find a single garden in Monroe County that will qualify. Um, but I mentioned that definition because if you're doing habitat restoration, like the DNC is trying to restore a meadow or restore a wetland or whatever, that when you're doing habitat restoration is your goal. So it, it's not something we can do in our gardens readily. But for those doing habitat restoration, that is really what they're trying to do to do a really good job in restoration. So then we can ask a question to ourselves. So we have, you know, for purposes of our pond or garden culture, it can be plants native to the Finger Lakes, or plants native to New York, or northeastern U.S., Great Lakes. So, or plants native to eastern U.S. As, as you move out, you can get trouble. Like there are plants native to eastern Mississippi that are invasive here in New York. So you know, if you make the definition too loose, you can get a little risky. So what we did for the pond or garden program, we said, okay. We're going to say, and if it's native to New York and suitable for selling sick, there's a few plants down in Long Island that can't bring up here because it won't grow. Um, and uh, then, then we'll consider it a native plant. If it, if it is a New York flora atlas on the internet, we can make these things up. We did include some plants from the northeastern US, mainly from Pennsylvania, because as climate change happens, some plants that are better drafted in the warm weather uh, are going to do well here with our gardens. So when you go plant shopping, though, you're going to pick, you, know, you, will, you will find native plants. You will find native plants from the list that they've been sending out later. <laughs> but you'll also find plants labeled as varieties, or it'll say VAR on the tag. That means a natural variation. It's something that happened naturally in nature. It breeds true from seed. Just an example, small Solomon seal is a nice native plant for shade gardens. There's actually two different Solomon seals here in New York State. Uh, one is basically short and one is tall, but they're, but they're both the same native species, but you'll see this VAR on the back because there's two different products that they from. They're all great for pollinator gardens. If there's a variety of a native plant that goes in New York, don't worry about it. You will find your pollinators will love it. Now we hit cultivars. This is where things get messy. Cultivar stands for cultivated variety. It means you know, we got involved, people got involved. A cultivar is going to be two things. They can be hybrids or they can be made of So a hybrid is something that has been created by crossing two different species. So somebody, you know, a plant breeder got two different species of cross created by people. 
They, they rarely breed true. They're usually propagated by cuttings or divisions in the nursery. Uh, we'll talk about hybrids on the next slide. Made of ours are selectively bred native plants. Right? They found a native plant, you know, just like we all look different. You know, all, the, all the different in a while, the native plants all look different. But tick button had a desirable characteristic. Maybe a flower is usually white, a flower is like pink. They took that one, they planted it, then they picked the pinkest one, they planted it again, and basically they, by what I'll call artificial selection, they finally got a flower that they kind of pink. And that's the native one they're going to, and then they, they can patent that and sell that at a, at a much higher profit margin than the native. So native ours are basically a selectively bred plant for some sort of improved garden trait, like the size, like the color, whatever. So let's talk about these two. We'll start with hybrids. So hybrids were designed for human appeal, for marketing. Uh, they were not designed for pollinators. They often have little or no nectar, and they're usually more expensive than the native plants. So this is kind of a lose-lose. They're going to cost you more money and probably be less good for pollinators. So I'll give you an example. Uh, these are all pictures from my garden. So I will admit that I do buy hybrids. Um, so we'll start with Echinacea purpurea. Uh, that's the common cone flower. It, it's on our approved list of native plant that was actually native to Ohio. We, we included it because it's very common here in, in the crash line of pollinators. You can see actually in my garden, I have a bee here, and we can be a back in that one as well. This you can see when it says X hybrida on the peg, that, that definitely means it's a hybrid. This one is called Paradisal mix. That one I got lucky. There's actually a bee back there. Uh, this this one of the bees in my garden still like. This one's called Pink Double Delight. I can guarantee you when you see the word double, forget it for pollinators. Because what they've done here is notice the center of the flower is all covered in fluff. I have in all the years I've had this plant never seen any pollinator on it. Because you know the pollinators, it's kind of like you know the old army sports where where's the bee? You know, it's looking, it's looking for nectar and it's all covered in fluff. Because you can't get there. There is no nectar. So that's one, and then this one, Sundown, it kind of looks like the other except for the color, but I've never seen a pollinator by the pollinator I've had it. So like, whatever created that color, or in the process of breeding that color, they lost the nectar. So I'm not saying don't buy these. I admitted I own all three of these. Uh, but I would say, you know, buy lots of this, plant, plant, plant big swaths of this one. And if you want some of these, you can make lovely cut bouquets. You know, sure, grow a few of these for cut bouquets. But grow lots and lots of them. So that's the hybrid story. We basically don't, you know, if you're looking at pollinator friendly, don't go down this way. So let's talk about native ours. As I said, that's a cultivated variety of native plant. They start with the native and then they selectively breed for a trait. Uh, it may be size. You see this a lot in trees and shrubs, where they bred them to be a little smaller, which would be nice for them. Um, so it's done for multiple generations, and the final plant is propagated by cuttings or divisions. So the question, are native ours good for pollinators? If that variety they probably have never have evolved in nature. And in fact, it might be so unusual may not survive in nature. This is a big open question right now. There's a lot of research going on. Of, are native ours good or not? I can't give you a definitive answer. I can tell you a little bit of what, what is known. So Doug Calame, again, who's really uh, has written a book on bringing nature home and very soon, they're a great resource. Uh, did a study on tree and shrub foliage variations. And you'll see a lot of you know, shrub, shrubs that have a white green full of variation or have more of a copper red color. So, what he found if you have these trees that have red or purple or darker foliage, they don't work as well for host plants. Probably because those red and purple pigments make the foliage taste bad. And the caterpillars that will be out of the butterflies but that don't like the taste or even are poisoned by the taste. On the other hand, if there's variegated foliage, it made no difference. They were, this is good for host plants, and in a few cases, they were even dead. So if you're out buying trees or shrubs, uh, and you see these different things out there, and it's, it's got some you know, white green variegation, and you, what you want to get as a host plant, it will probably be just fine. If it's got some more red, dark purple foliage, it probably won't be quite as well. Uh, then the Mount Cuba Center, which is another center that studies native plants a lot, did a big study on hydrangea arborescens, which is our smooth hydrangea. It's a native plant here. If you go looking in the nursery, you can find a couple dozen different native ours of that smooth hydrangea. Some are mop heads, and some are lace caps. The original plant in the, in the wild was a lace cap. But many years ago, somebody found a mop head growing in the wild. And they started cultivating that one. Why the Annabelle is the most famous. 
that the mod headed quartz is a prettier flower than the next one. So I'm not sure what the study. <clears throat> and this is how hard this is. <clears throat> you know, they went out and they planted a whole, all these different hydrangeas in, in, in the field. And they had volunteers come out every day and go to each plant and stare at one flower for a minute to count the pollinators. And they did that all summer long. Because that's, I mean, we're really going to figure this out. That's the type of research you have to do. What they found after the whole, whole summer's work <clears throat> is that the mop heads get, had less than half the good of the yellow. So <clears throat> if you're trying to track pollinators, you want the lace cap, uh, not the mop head. So the, le and the lesson here is this native bars are fine, but just avoid the plant that's very different than the native. You know, if the flowers are big mop heads and the lace cap, or it's purple full of instead of green. You know, try and, try and pick your native bars a little closer. If it's simply a different size, it's a, it's a, it's a shrub design for a smaller, it's fine. It's, just, it's, it's a different size. So we basically want to stay as close to looking like the native as we can. <clears throat> okay, we're going to start with native trees and shrubs because they're going to provide those high and mid canopy layers uh, that really help. They also can create shade plant habitats. If you want to have a little shade garden in your, in your yard, the tall trees and shrubs can create that shade. They're also large host plants. Think about how many leaves on a tree versus a little perennial. They're massive host plants. So if you really want to have lots and lots of insects around to protect the birds, trees are great. And of course, they provide lots of shelter and nesting area for birds, insects, and other things. So quite a lot of benefit. <clears throat> Admittedly, you may not have any room in your yard right now for a large deciduous tree. You may have all the trees you need. But if you lost an ash or MLS for or so a tree that top of a windstorm or something, or you have you have an opening. Uh, in terms of native large deciduous trees. Uh, we have lots of different maples here native to upstate, upstate New York. They're a host. Let's see, I wrote myself some notes here. Maple is a host for lots of different moths. Uh, we have a couple different, three actually different birches that are native. The birches are hosts for morning cloak butterflies and lots of moths. Shade bark hickory is a host. I guess I'll just bring this up because I shouldn't have to walk back and forth. Uh, <laughs> Shade bark hickory for banded hair streak and moths. And the tulip poplar is a host for the tiger swallowtail. Um, so all these plants are good. So this is a tulip poplar flower. That's of course the lovely bark of the birch. The one in the next one. Uh, the black gum is a host for moths. The eastern sycamore for more moths. The oak for the banded hair streak butterfly. But the oak is probably the best. It's a host of you know, 500 different mosses. So it's a wonderful host plant. I'm a little worried about sudden oak look. The disease is coming in, so we hope that doesn't cause a problem. But oaks are great. Uh, sassafras is a host for uh, <clears throat> variety of things. Linden is a host for eastern tiger swallowtails, red spotted purples, admirals, and moths. So all of these, you know, that these are flowers of the linden. Um, of course, oaks are their acorns. So they're, they're all big, wonderful trees. They're great host plants. But I'll admit that you know your yard may already be developed this far. We don't have room for something as big. But if you do, you know, basically, if you, if you need to replace a tree, go a native. Yeah, yeah, really, yeah, yeah, the wonders for the pollinators in your yard. So smaller trees and shrubs are easy. Uh, let's start with serviceberry, wonderful butterfly host plant for viceroys and red spotted purples, etc. Uh, it has these lovely white flowers in the spring, and then it produces a blue berry, which turns out like a blue berry, which the cedar waxing is absolutely cool. Uh, I've been told serviceberry pie is delicious. And very nice little flavor, but unless you're out there really fast, the cedar wax will come in and strip every berry off your tree. It's just, it's just wonderful. There are lots of native ours that service berry, or basically some of our native service berries are really big. You can get varieties that are much smaller and fit your yard much better. And they work. I, I have one that's only supposed to grow like this tall. Right now it's not like this big, but even last summer we had like four or five berry pounds. So it's, just, it's clearly producing flowers that are affecting pollinators and birds, and, and the, the berries are here, even when it's only this big. Uh, Soakberry comes in both red and black. That's a, a, that's a red one here. It's a host for butterflies, um, like the coral hair streak uh, and various moths. It gets its name because the, the berries are extremely tart. Um, the genus name is Aronia. Some of you heard of Aronia juice. It's like a Health food use for the antioxidants, they pour a lot of sugar in that juice to make it palatable. Um, so the berries can persist in the winter. They 
basically until they go to a bunch of freeze thaw cycles, or until the birds get really hungry, they don't get eaten. So I've got I've got the red silk berry in my yard. Uh, all the berries are still on it. I think probably typically in my yard in February or March, the birds will finally get hungry enough to come after it. So it gives you some nice winter interest. You've got a, a bush up there with lovely red berries on it, right, you know, right out here in January. So very attractive shrub. Dogwoods are a wonderful plant. Uh, there's a dogwood for every place. There's dogwoods like the flowering dogwood that grow in the sun, the pagoda dogwood that has partial shade, the red osier dogwood that grow in wet soils. You can find a dogwood for pretty much any place in your yard. There's, there's lots of native ours available. They make them they're either just playing with the size or not playing with foliage or flowers, just playing with size. It's a host plant for uh, azure butterflies, birds like the fruit. Uh, it's really dogwoods are a wonderful thing to put into your yard. Smooth hydrangea, I mentioned that earlier, the little with the lace caps, but it's a wonderful uh, flowering plant for parcel shade. Spice bush, uh, it's again a host of spice bush swallowtail, uh, lovely yellow flowers, the birds like to the birds will like berries when they ripen up. Um, that one will again like to do a little partial shade. Nine bark is a host of lots of moths, very attractive foliage. Uh, so it's another very attractive sh uh, shrub for your yard. And I think just one more page of shrubs. Pussy willow is a great one. So, you know, we all know the pussy willow blooms so early. So it's one of the ones when the when, when, when the when the the pollen when the bees and things in the spring are just waking up and tons of the bumblebees and things that are looking for nectar. It's one of the very, very first things to bloom and, be, and being a large or a bush, lots and lots of flowers. But all the all those pussy willows all over all those stems, they all start as flowers. That's really great. We have one and it's covered with bees in the spring. Yeah, because that, 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 it's like one of the first things to bloom and the bees are out and they're hungry and there it is, it's right? Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it is a great one. Uh viburnum, arrowwood, manny berry, the berries attracted the bird. Again, it's a host uh for spring as your butterflies. So I you know, there's a list that they will send out to you that I provided has a lot more native. Trees and shrubs on it, but there are really lots of interesting things you can put out that are great for the pollinators. So let's talk about native perennials. Um, they're attractive to our pollinators. Uh, they're adapted to a local environment. It is important for our native perennials to remember: right plant, right place. You know, if it needs sun, don't put it in the shade, and vice versa. If it needs a wet environment, don't put it in the middle of your dry sunny yard. You know, so just put it in the right place, and then plan for you said early. Mid and late. Things have been early, things midsummer, things late. So let's talk about some examples. The, the list, the list like that I'll send out is like three pages long. Like obviously I can't talk through three pages of plants here, but let's just do a few. Uh, some earlier perennials, moss flocks is one of my favorites as a ground cover. Uh, you know, it's the mulch and use this stuff. Uh, it grows in the sun. It's it is a, it is a ground cover. No one grows about this tall in the spring, it has these beautiful, you can get flowers with Paint or blue or variegated. Uh, it's a zero work ground cover because you never have to clean it up. In the spring, when the drops just leave, they just fall underneath and new leaves come out. It's, and it'll it controls the weeds, the weeds just as well as mulch. But it's alive, colorful. We have the ground nesting bees can go right through it to be their habitat. So if you, if you want mulch that you never have to replace, never have to clean up, never have to do anything, look at the moss blocks. Golden Alexanders or, or Heartleaf Alexander. They bloom really early with these yellow flowers. Nice, attractive uh, plant for your garden in the spring. Red columbine, if you've got some parcel shade, it's a lovely woodland plant. Attracts lots of pollinators, attracts hummingbirds. It's a host plant for the butterfly. Uh, very attractive plant to have. Cranesbill geranium, again, another thing to make a brown cover. It's a little higher than the moss box, but a little bit higher. Lovely flowers. There's a lot of different perennial geraniums out there that aren't native. Uh, the the, uh, cultivar, the, Suzanne, the uh, Suzanne cultivar, for example, or uh, Roseanne cultivar is not native. But you can find uh, this one in nurseries. Uh, it's a lovely plant that you use in your garden, early spring flowers. <clears throat> for shade, uh, baneberry, it comes in white or red. Uh, deer won't eat it. Foliage kind of looks like a still be. The lovely white and red berries late in the year, very attractive. Solomon seal I mentioned earlier, 
as those attractive flowers along the stem and the tall or short. I will cause them to be or be like my solid seal. So I haven't killed it, but I do spray it very hard sometimes. So if you have a big deer problem, that one may not be uh, quite as appealing. And then one more on the early uh, fall Solomon seal uh, has these white flowers held by red fruit. Uh, again, crash pollinators, the birds like those berries. And foam flower is a very attractive woodland plant. With, there's lots of different foliage variations in those days. Right? This is where people have gone out and found different foliage variations and then bring them in. But the flowers work the same, the pollinators are all of the flowers and the, the track lots of pollinators. So this gives you about you know, 12 examples or so of some early ones. Let's go on to mid. So we've got, and we're getting into summer now. Uh, of course, I'm going to recommend that every garden has some milk. Yeah, we're really worried about the monarchs. So it'd be great for every garden to have some milk for the monarchs. So this is the only host plant they use. Um, the foliage is deer resistant. I'll say most of the time. Okay. I used to, I, I, I've had these slides a few years. I always used to say the foliage is completely deer resistant. And last summer I had a fawn in my yard and the fawn thought the foliage was great. Uh, but, but usually they don't. Uh, sometimes the flower buds get eaten by deer, but using my foliage, using my milkweeds don't get touched at all. Um, so there's lots of native milkweeds for upstate New York. Common milkweed is probably too aggressive for most gardens. Unless you've got a forever wild area or something where it'll be confined, common milkweed, because it's spread by rhizomes, uh, tend to take over the garden. So you probably don't want that one. Butterfly weed is the one I have a picture of there with the lovely orange flowers. That's a bush milkweed. It doesn't spread by rhizomes at all. You put one in, it'll stay just one. It may self seal if you're lucky, but it really tends to be quite well behaved. Hope milkweed, that can grow in partial shade. Swamp milkweed, actually, once you get established, will tolerate normal soils. Um, so that's the sport, it's actually even more than that, like world milkweed and purple milkweed and various things. So there's lots of great milkweeds you can grow that are well behaved in the garden, and the monarchs will use all of the host plants. Another good one that I recommend are the Isaac Joe pie weeds. Um, they're tall, so they're great for the back of the garden. Uh, they'll tolerate moist and, or average or even dry soil. They are super attractive pollinators. These big kind of pinkish purple flowers will be just covered with bees and wasps and butterflies and for all, all for the midsummer. They just they have an abundant nectar. And so if you have room in the back of a garden or the center of a garden bed, uh, the Joe Pie weeds do a superb job. There's a native art called Little Joe, but we still about this fall, um, that does really well in gardens. Um, so this is what I recommend just because such pollinator magnet. And then <clears throat> Pearly Everlasting is a host for <coughs> Painted Lady and American Lady butterflies. Uh, it is completely deer resistant, even with the fawn. The fawn didn't touch this one last year. This one is, they don't, they don't touch at all. Uh, trash lots of pollinators. This is one where I told you it could have you could preserve these gardens to ignore insect damage. Because there's a host for Painted Lady and other uh, a couple of butterflies. In the early summer, my curly everlasting plants look off. So almost all the leaves are curled because there's a little caterpillar in that leaf doing the uh, eating and growing and doing its business. So my, my curly everlasting in the early summer look really bad. And then the caterpillars put in the butterfly, the plant puts out new foliage and flowers and puts food. It never dies, it's not damaged. Uh, but this, this is a case where you learn from your bug calendar lesson. You know, it looks awful, it's just walk away and not look at it right now. Uh, it looks fine later. <coughs> the Monardas, the bee balm, and the wild bergamot uh, attract lots of pollinators and hummingbirds. Uh, you'll get several different color choices, purples and reds and things, uh, but they all do well. Uh, nice, attractive plant. Maybe get a little powdery and mildew, but doesn't tend to kill it. Mountain mints are a plant you may not have heard of. Uh, they've become really popular in gardening the last couple of years. Uh, they are actually not a mint, and they don't typically grow on mountains. It's one of the strange common names. Um, so unlike mints, they don't spread aggressively. They're well behaved in the garden. They're very attractive pollinators. They bloom for a long time with abundant white blooms and abundant nectar. The, the deer never touch them, so they're really a nice plant. Um, I only heard about this plant within the last two or three years. They, they really recently come in the nursery trade. Uh, but there are several different mountains available. They're fun plants to grow. Uh, for the shade, Bugbane uh, has these lovely spiky flowers that attract lots of pollinators. The deer never touch it. 
Um, so it's really a factor of shade plant that will have pioneers in this summer. So let's talk about late perennials. This is, you know, we're talking about August into September, October. This is time when a lot of gardens start looking like no flowers anymore. And yet, you know, the, 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 the bumblebees, the, the new queens are kind of bad up for winter. The last of the monarchs have come out of their cocoons and they're going to south. You know, lots and lots of insects are really still very hungry at this time of year. Golden rods are really superb late perennials. They produce abundant nectar. Now, some are going to say, but what about all the allergies? Actually, almost no one is allergic to goldenrod because the pollen is extremely large. What people are allergic to is the ragweed that blooms at the same time. So it's guilt by association. Mm -hmm. you know, the the goldenrods, go ahead and grow goldenrods. Nobody's going to see it. You know, they're, 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 nobody's allergic to that pollen. And if you leave the seed heads, the birds love the seeds. So I, I love growing goldenrod because in my garden, I walk on the, in the late in the early fall, and those flowers are just covered in bees and wasps and stuff. But they're just loaded. And then, you know, a few weeks later, a month later, the sparrows and finches are all over and eating the seed. So they're just fun to have. Uh, there's a common goldenrod. There's a, quite, there's, a, there's a native art called fireworks, which is in the picture there. Stiff goldenrod goes what this tall, a flatter flower. Zigzag goldenrod grows in shady areas, uh, but it's still attached to pollinators, so they're huge. You can find these, you can find a golden rod for anywhere, and they're, they're really attractive to pollinators. Another one, of course, are our asters. We have, I think, a dozen or more different asters that are native upstate New York. Uh, again, they flower in the fall. They're actually a host plant for pearl crescent butterflies. Um, so you can, you know, whatever height you want, really low to tall, and colors kind of from white to purples. You can find an, a native aster that will do that. I, I listed four species here. The list that they're going to send out to you probably have a dozen different species on it. Asters are wonderful plants that bloom late up upon itself. Sometimes deer will go after them. So you may have to get heavy, heavy deer, you may have to lost the deer nibble, but they're wonderful late perennials. <clears throat> In shade, uh, there's wood asters. Um, and these things will thrive in dry shade. I've got a dry shade garden in my front yard where I've got a big linden tree and a big silver maple. So when I first bought the house, there was no grass because nothing could grow in that shade in that dry condition. The wood asters laugh at it. The wood asters, are, I, I have to control how fast they spread. They would take over the whole thing up. Like they would have to be up. They would grow right up against the silver maple with maple trunk. And in the dry shade, they, they, they have no problem with it. They're like the other asters, they're still a host for butterflies. The birds still like the seeds with nice, nice white flowers in the fall. So if you've got a dry, shady area where you can't grow grass, you can grow asters, you can grow the golden rods, they'll do just fine. And finally, it's a couple others. <clears throat> a white turtle head that likes moisture soils. Uh, it's a thing, it's a host for Baltimore checker spot butterflies. It has these lovely flowers that the bumblebees love. The woodland sunflower. Goes about this tall, uh, attractive yellow flowers in late summer. It's a host again, a butterfly host plant. Again, last summer when I had the fawn doing havoc in the rest of my yard, the fawn didn't touch this stuff. The fawn didn't find that palatable at all. Uh, it's a host for painted lady, butter, painted lady butterflies. It's another nice uh, late summer bloom. <clears throat> okay, so those were all New York natives. I'll just talk about in the last couple minutes here. A few other Eastern U.S. natives. These are native to New, not to New York, but native to Pennsylvania nearby. <clears throat> I do come up as, as gardeners. We go when we're traveling. Sometimes you stop by a nursery in Pennsylvania or someplace you know where it's a home. If you're shopping at, at other states, do be aware. For example, cup plant is invasive in New York, but it's native to Ohio and the Midwest. So, in this case, you could be shopping someplace and it looks lovely in their native. It's in the native plant section in that nursery in Ohio. Don't bring it home. Uh, <laughs> So this blue false indigo, native to Pennsylvania, it's a butterfly host plant for orange sulfur butterflies. It has these lovely blue flowers in the spring. Deer tongue, testament, native to Pennsylvania again. It's, uh, it's, it's another good, a couple good early ones. For mid-season, I talked about the cone flowers earlier. Cone flowers are great. Just beware of all the hybrids. Uh, Blazing star, the actress. 
might have been native to New York, so that is unknown. It will slowly spread. Lovely spiky flowers that the butterflies just love. It's about that tall. So I, I use it as a lot of my beds. It's a very attractive plant. And then garden flowers, of course, uh, it's, made, it's not native to New York, it is native to Pennsylvania. Lots of different colors. You will, of course, get some deer browse occasionally, but, but floss is a great garden plant for pollinators. <clears throat> and then just a couple late ones Black eyed Susan. Um, it's native to the eastern U.S. It's a, you know, host that, and the deer don't go after it. And the blue sage, another one. So, just some late eastern U.S. perennials. I think we're almost done here. I'm <clears throat> just coming at yeah. So, you know, is it bad to grow non-native plants? No. Yeah, you can create some interesting garden designs. So, the foliage or bloom contrast, the texture. There's all the spring bulbs for spring color. None of the daffodils, tulips. They're not native, but the pollinators love them in the spring. Just you know, don't buy something invasive. Just make sure you don't get to an invasive plant in your garden. It'll drive you nuts. And then of course, annuals are a nice, quick, easy way to add nectar sources. You know, change your garden design every year. Uh, just kind of prefer, go for, again, watch out for those doubles and unusual blossoms. Go for the you know, simple ones. Make sure the plants are pesticide free, uh, and you're all set. So I think I just have two slides left. <clears throat> If you, if you want to learn more, um, there's a series of books written by Heather Holm. Uh, and the Pollinators book is a general book. She did a whole book on bees, and then recently did a whole book on wasps. Um, they're great books to learn more about the pollinators. For the bee and wasp books, she walks through species by species, what flowers they want, and for the wasps, for the, for the wasps, she walks through what flower does the adult wasp eat, and then what, what is it hunting? What, you know, what, what, what insects will it hunt? Cold so, she's focused on the eastern U.S. That's a great resource. And then finally, uh, you'll get these links in the slides. There's a link to our pollinator garden program, a link to our general website, and then we do have a helpline you can call uh, and leave a message, and they'll get back to you, or you can send them an email through our website. And I'll answer any other questions you have. But thank you all for attending. What about hollyhocks? Um, uh, uh, hollyhocks are they're not native, but they're great. The, the, the flowers, the pollen, if you like. Yeah. Once we start getting the nice weather in March on those that are out in the garden, I'm always reluctant to start cleaning up, the spring cleanup because of everything. Yeah, yeah. How late? How late should we go before we really start cleaning up and disrupting what's spring? Uh, no, I, I find the. I can make it. Yeah, it depends. Like, um, like the leaves, I don't raise. Um, most of my spring flowers come right up through them, so I just leave them. Um, and like a lot of the old perennials are just like, if you just knock them over, yeah, if you knock them over, the insects that are there still there. Um, so I try, you know, we could try, try to do as little as possible, or you know, the, the cut and drop, you know, cut and drop, chop and drop. You know, if I'm going to do something, can I just leave it where it was? I mean, maybe it's knocked over, maybe it's just, you know, looks a little nice if it is not the best up there, but if I, if I can leave it where it was, yeah, whatever insects really are, are still there. Um, so, but, so like if your leaves, if you if you get if you have lots of big trees and way too many leaves, uh, the suggestion is maybe in the fall kind of move them around to places where you can them, and then because then the things are, are still there. Because it's, it's minimizing. Oh, we had an interesting statistic that I missed about how many caterpillars that chicken. It's six to nine thousand. Six to nine thousand per. Yeah, so 6,000 to 9,000 per nest. Yeah. 69,000. Yeah, so so it's so for, for, for one for one nest and chicken. Yeah, so, somebody so can turn Doug Calibay, one of those grad students, sit there watching a nest and comes to the I have a creek that runs through my backyard, and it overflows sometimes. And I want to put something back there. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of stuff can match. What would you suggest if that means anything? Um, one thing they did that the Randy Smith Parkway volunteers, they got uh, a small willow species, a really kind of creepy willow species. They put the willow along the creek edge because they were having erosion problems. Well, two things the willow is a native, um, so it, 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 it's a good native plant. They kept the creek when the creek flooded, the roots held the, the bed in place. And just to keep it twiggy, once a year we go and cut those willows off about excess height, and then they, they, they push out. And so we're holding them at that height. 
but they would they go along with the creek bed and they hold the roots hold in place and the willow willows love our soil so they're fine with that. So that's that's probably others too. Like if you look for things that tolerate very wet soils, but if, if you if the creek bed is, is potentially eroding, then some, uh, something bushy is nice because the roots will hold and the roots will keep that tree bed from washing up and being around. But otherwise little their plants might just wash away. That's yeah, yeah. yeah. The two biggest <clears throat> pollinators in our flower garden is hyacinth. They get really yeah, large, yeah. large purple, and yeah. they're actually colored with yep. all types of bees, um, monarch butterflies, mm -hmm. black and purple. Yeah. Yeah. What, what category is that following? I think one of the two is a bee. There's some hyssopus native and some that's not. I think I have, I have to say, purple, really, both of our yeah, I have to say, there's all our purple and green. There, there are some that are either native or close to the native. But I'd have, I'd have to consult my list. Is it the odor? The, it really is like a perfume. Or, 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 or it's the flowers. I mean, it's really it's, a, it's because it's, it's, flowers are nectar rich. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really nectar rich variety. And they, can, they make them keep coming back. I mean, so yeah. even the bumblebees, <laughs> that's yeah. where the honeybees honey over them. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I think that. Like, if, if, if the flower it does not have a lot of nectar, once one insect comes in and, and eats it, and eats the nectar, it's empty. If it produces abundant nectar, they'll keep coming back. Yeah. So if it's, it's more, it may not be the same as much. If, if it's an abundant nectar producer, you know, one bee can come, another bee can come, they can keep coming because there's still nectar. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned um, uh, Ivy. Yeah. We have a lot of chocolate chocolate ivy. The pollen is so good. Yeah. Yep, the dolphin is covered with it. It may not be as good as a host plant, but the flowers are still holding up. Uh, so, so maybe it's not, I can't remember if Joe Pye is a host plant. I think it's, anyway, if it, if it, it may not make it, it probably makes no difference to the next. But then, if, it, if you see it covered in pollen, as you know, it's made no difference to happen. Okay. If it is a host plant, I'm forgetting it. I have a great um, weight. Season two, yeah. 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 It's gorgeous. It's probably six feet tall. It's an annual perennial. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, I guess, just yeah. Throw seeds down. Yeah. Right. Sure. There's lots of annuals that extract lots. Yeah. I mean, that's why that's why I include annuals. They're not yeah. native, but you get you get one full pollen or and that's for yeah. They're yeah, it's a great lady. Yeah. And late now, when you get those late flowers, you're right. They they they're, they're covered. Yeah. This is weird, but what about sumac berries? Yeah. I've never seen No, sumac is a wonderful native plant. I didn't include it because um, the, the, the staghorn sumac tends to be a bit aggressive for spreading. Now, fragrant sumac doesn't spread aggressively. So I have, I have some fragrant sumac in my yard. No, and sumac varies the birds. Yeah, I mean, there, there is a poison sumac that's for a different plant, which I'm sure you don't have. Uh, but no, normal sumac is not poisonous. And it's a wonderful it's a wonderful pollinator plant when it blooms, and it's a wonderful plant for birds. I just, you know, I can only put so many things on the list, and because because staghorn uh, tends to be a bit aggressive, uh, I don't mention it in talks. But it'll, it'll take over a whole backyard over there. I didn't know whether to cut it down or keep it. Oh no, it's a one. I'll keep it. You, I mean, you may want to you may want to control it a bit if it's spreading too much. It's a wonderful native plant. Yeah. 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 Other questions? Yeah. Um, we have some blackberry plants that are coming along pretty well, mm -hmm. but um, increasingly we've had bees like burrow into the berries. Mm -hmm. So you've got to watch what you think. Yes. Um, but mm -hmm. what, are they, are they, what are they doing? I love this. It's like the you know, beekeepers sometimes put out sugar water to feed their bees in the sugar fruit that they it's, it's that nice sweet fruit, fruit is full of sugar. They're going for that lovely sugar water, basically. Because mm -hmm. they, they can. They can take your pet, what they're eating out of the middle of your berry and take back and feed it to your young. I mean, like I've got a friend who raises bees, you know, and then when the neck is a little short, he'll put actually I'll put out sugar water for his bees, and his bees will take the sugar water back to the hive. So think of your blackberries being a lovely, a lovely sweet sugar water source, and the bees are going there and taking back to the neck. Yeah. 
happening. So they're happy. You're, uh, I, yeah, you should go backwards too. You're not because that backward, yeah. Even if you wanted to pick it, it's it's the damage. Even after the DV, it's now it's now a damage period. So yeah. Uh, second question. Yeah. Um, I see you never seen these uh, high risk high. Um, are they in college? Um, there is a, a native virus component to them, and a lot of the irises, of course, are, are they're not native, and they were probably hybrids and bred. But they were bred for whatever beautiful flower you have, and they may either the either pollinator is not in this area, or they don't even have a lot of nectar anymore. They were bred to be that beautiful shape. But there are there are some native viruses that definitely affect. Thank you. Yeah,